justice dialogue is um, it's a construct of uh, I Buffalo and it's our attempt to uh, talk, keep up the conversation about what we want to see um, as change uh, for our society, um, for our institutions, and uh, we try to uh, uh, address a broad uh, array of concerns, uh, social justice, uh, political justice, uh, economic, ecological. Um, so here we have Bill Nowak coming to speak about geothermal, which is exciting and important, uh, green alternative for producing electricity. Um, and hopefully, uh, Bill, you're not too disappointed in our bumbling around with the screen and so forth. I, and, I we'll, love it. and we'll have you back in, in April that we talked about. Okay, okay very good. Uh, everyone, uh, Bill Nowak, ge geothermal, heating, cooling, no need to fry. Right. Um, and I can stay seated. Is that, that going to work for you? That's fine. Okay. Um, I have a bunch of slides to show you. I have been working with a company called Buffalo Geothermal since the spring. And I, I don't formally work for them. My, my job is with the Communication Workers of America Union. Um, but I have done, I've gone on a bunch of the kind of sales jobs, and I've also worked a couple um, jobs installing geothermal to get to know it because I would like A to help this company because I think it's really important and B, you know, maybe in retirement this is something um, I would do. <coughs> I have a couple of fun things planned. I'm going to make you amateur physicists by the time this is done and yoga masters. Oh, I call it geothermal yoga and you're going to master it as part of this. Um, Okay, Okay. so this is the structure of how I wanted to do this. I'm going to do an introduction and I'm going to spend some time on climate change because I think climate change is a really important reason why I'm involved with it and I wanted to express some information about that. And then essentially talk to you about how it works, give you some examples of it, take you through pictures of an installation, talk about the different kinds of loops, um, and talk about the cost. Anybody have any experience with geothermal here? Only, only very minor experience, in the sense that my mother, who's 96 years old, is living in a retirement community uh -huh. uh, near Philadelphia, okay. where the heating is by heating and cooling are by geothermal. Great. And I've been there. The temperature is always. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so it does work. It's a very comfortable form. Yeah. Why don't we do a quick just uh, round of introductions um, so that everybody gets to know each other a little bit. Like like um, Carol, Karen said, I'm Bill Nowak. Been active on renewable energy issues in a number of forms for a bunch of years. I'm uh, Jeff O'Connell, one of the unofficial videographers of Occupy Buffalo and General Booster, and also ongoingly interested in this topic. I'm Chris Barbera. I'm with Occupy Buffalo. My main focus is with uh, uh, education with prisoners um, and the homeless community. But uh, I like to, I support all these environmental measures as well. I like to inform myself in the morning. Hi, I'm all part of Occupy. I've always been interested in green energy, and you know, I'm always going to get um, I'll learn more about it. Is that Adam? Is that? Yeah. Um, uh, I'm Heron Simmons. Uh, I'm on the board of directors of uh, Green Options Buffalo. And I want to say thank you to Heron. I mean, I think it's great that he's put this series together, and I know he's sacrificed a lot of his time and energy to make this happen, so thank you. My name is Jonathan Bidor. I'm interested in geothermal heating. I own an alternative energy company myself, and I'd like love to see this happen in Buffalo. Great. I'm Joel Huberman, and um, I'm a retired scientist. I used to work at Roswell Park, and um, I'm also very interested in alternative energy. We are in the process right now of getting solar panels installed on our, our house. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Laura So.
Okay, so that's kind of worldwide what's going on with the climate. But in terms of Western New York, I, I did some consulting work for Riverkeeper this, I don't, I don't know when it was, last fall, and looked specifically at what they're projecting from New York State. And the kind of four major areas of problems are those. You know, the, the temperature's gonna warm up quite a bit. And this is a diagram of what the, the summers are gonna look like in Western New York if we, if we go full out uh, into keeping pouring climate for pouring carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So essentially, we are, and it goes kind of in, in a number of years, but down by 2070, we're at the climate of Georgia in summertime. Yeah. You know, it's important to take the, the difference between weather and climate. You know, weather is something that happens short term, and it, this could be, you know, some function of solar flares or, or ocean currents or something, we don't know for sure. That's the thing about climate change. We are gonna see big changes, but you don't, you're never gonna be able to tell exactly that a specific event is about the climate. And what it is, it's like loading dice. Um, when you load dice, you don't know if a particular roll you get is a roll because you loaded the dice or because that's what they would have been anyway. But you know over time, you're gonna get more and more events in, in the direction of the way you loaded the dice. And at this point, we are loading the dice. So, with, you know, with warmer temperatures, yes, it's pleasant, uh, you know, when, when spring comes early in Buffalo, but, you know, it's, it's really serious. There's been a lot of loss of human life. Um, this, this says that the amount of deaths in the summer caused by uh, excess heat, you know, outdoes out all other weather events combined, including lightning and hurricanes and tornadoes. Okay, pre precipitation change. We're, we're being projected at this point to have a lot more rain in the spring, and it's not clear what's gonna happen through the, the summer months, but by the end of the summer months, we're gonna either have slightly more rain or less rain is, is what's being projected. But the thing is, that the heat, with the heat going up, there's gonna be so much more evaporation that we're looking at a lot of droughts. And that's what this is talking about. You know, yeah, we're gonna have summer rain, but it's just gonna be more. And you know, maybe in, in uh, Hollywood movies, that kid's gonna win this fight, but. <laughs> um, extreme events. This, this, is, this is where I get really scared because you know, essentially you have a system and you're maintaining more heat in the system and it's gonna churn the system up. And we've already seen it, you know, there's, there's a company called Munich Ray, which is Munich Reinsurance, and it's a company that insures insurance companies. And they are really on top of this, and they see the impacts of climate change are really going to be very serious for them. And you know, they see that they're going to need to up their insurance, and and they're doing something about it in terms of spreading information, and you know, backing some of the studies and so on and so forth. But this is 2011 in Tennessee. I don't know if folks remember in 2009 in our southern tier, there was extreme flooding that happened. Um, this, believe it or not, is a nuclear plant last year. Mm -hmm. You know, and we were dealing with Fukushima in Japan, but this was kept pretty quiet. But this was surrounded by water uh, in Nebraska. And apparently there wasn't a meltdown, but you know, this is kind of how close we came to this kind of thing. Okay, in terms of ice cover, there's gonna be less ice cover on, on Lake Erie, and we saw that this year there wasn't any. And you might want to ask, you know, What's wrong with that? What's the problem with less ice cover? Longer lake effect storm season. You know, that's kind of what the blizzard of, this is the blizzard of 1977. And we can expect to see that. We kind of lucked out this year, at least so far. You never know what <laughs> Um Okay, so this is the, the climate record over 600,000 years. And the, um, the bottom piece is temperature, the white going across is temperature and the top is, is carbon dioxide concentrations. And you can see there's a real close linkage there. And you can also see, you know, I mean, you're talking about a scale of 100,000 years in those last two blocks. You can see how extremely it's going up at this point, and you can imagine what's gonna be happening with the temperature. You know, the red is, is a, a projection of, of what's gonna be happening over the next, uh, I believe it's 40 years. Okay, this is two, um, Scenarios on, on the left, 
you're looking at kind of the probability of temperature change by 2100 if we don't do anything, if we keep going on the same, um, the same way we're going. And you see kind of the largest possibility is five to six degrees centigrade, which is a lot more Fahrenheit. You know, I, I'm not sure what the translation is, but it's probably like 12 degrees Fahrenheit. If, if you know, there, there's really, uh, and the policy scenario is by an organization that's projecting doing a lot of uh, renewable energy, so we're not gonna keep putting as much carbon dioxide out. We are facing, you know, climate change and temperature increases and warming no matter what we do at this point. You know, the carbon dioxide that's in the air is gonna be there for 100 years. The methane that's being put up there through hydrofracking, they project 20 years on that. So, you know, it's gonna be happening for a long time. And, and the more we add to it now, the worse it's gonna be. But we do have a choice of, of doing something that's gonna make it, hopefully, so it's not quite so severe. And this is, this is, I think, a really good quote. It's from a, a Christian organization that does kind of missionary work and um, you know relief work. And climate change often doesn't look just like bad weather. It looks like ethnic violence or religious violence or banditry or civil war. You know, essentially, you look historically at the causes of war. A lot of it has to do with resources. And what we're doing with changing the climate at this point is we're cutting down on the resources. If there's a drought, people are going to be hungry. They're going to encroach on other people's land. We're going to have war. And a lot of the problem I see going forward into the future has to do with creating refugees. Um, we're going to create unlivable situations for people. And there's just going to be millions and millions of people kind of wandering the planet trying to get into countries that haven't been as damaged. And you see the kind of chaos we have in our country not even being able, being able to deal with our border situation today, which is really pretty mild. And you can imagine you know, what that's going to mean in terms of war and hostilities in, in the world. And it's interesting, to, you, can, you can go, the Defense Department has looked at this. And you think, you know, of all the people who are, are going to not be sympathetic to you know, the whole kind of renewable energy, let's, let's screen the world kind of thing, it would be these realists in the Defense Department. But they looked at it, and they see you know, very intense consequences coming up. This was a report done in 2010. Um, I'm sorry for the, you know, they're not going to be able to read it that well, but they're talking about um, climate change could contribute to poverty, environmental degradation, uh, weakening of fragile governments, um, food and water scarcity, spread of diseases, and mass migration. You know, they're also looking at what this means for their military installations, but they realize it's going to mean a lot in terms of kind of conflict between people in the future. And this, to me, is the picture you know, of what we're facing at this point. We're facing you know, people who have been uprooted from their land in, in situations where the weather is no longer consistent enough to su supply us with uh, food to the degree that, that we need it. OK, so let's, let's try and get a little hopeful at this point. This, this gentleman, Robert Sokolow, is a scientist uh, at Princeton University. And there's a few scientists that have really looked on a broad level at what needs to happen if we're going to avoid the worst aspects of climate change. And I think this quote is very interesting because, it, and what he's saying essentially is that, you know, in terms of emissions, the rich in the future are going to need to um, equal today's poor. And when I think the typical American looks at that, they probably say, oh, shit, you know, I'm going to have to live like a poor person. But that's not what he's saying, really. What he's saying is between cutting down on, on our, adding to our efficiency, cutting down on the way we use energy, and then being able to generate energy renewable, we could get to a point where people can live comfortably um, using the same amount of energy as today's poor people do. And it's going to be a balance, you know, between that comfort and, and getting to the levels we need to get to. Um, but this to me is a really profound statement. So what, what he has projected is the stabilization wedges. Um, the, the black dotted line is essentially the direction we're facing in terms of carbon dioxide emissions. And what he's saying is that we need to cut back uh, seven gig gigatons per year of carbon. A gigaton of carbon is huge. You know, it is 
hundreds of thousands of wind turbines around the world. This, this, um, his work and this image to me is really important because when people say, oh, you know, we don't need those wind turbines on the hill near me, or we don't need, you know, why don't we just go with solar on our roofs? It's not like it's one or the other. It's like we need to do six or seven of those things and we need to do them on a scale that we have never seen and that we have never been able to get the kind of unity and resources behind. So it, it, we don't have the luxury of kind of sitting back and waiting for somebody else to do it or you know, kind of whining, really. I mean, people have legitimate concerns and they should be expressed, but we really need to take into account the gravity of what we're facing. And this essentially shows the same thing. It's, it's another group of things. And you can see one of the things that, that's on there is carbon sequestration at the bottom. I think most people in this room would say carbon sequestration, you know, is just an excuse for the coal industry and it's not going to work. So maybe, you know, we eliminate that one and we have to create something else. But there's, there's really a lot of work to do. So what this shows, and once again, I apologize if you can't really see it that well. Um, the, the emissions of doing space conditioning by various regions in the United States. The black over on the left is if you use geothermal heating and cooling. And you have carbon emissions with geothermal heating and cooling because you're still using electricity. Okay, so this is projecting that. The, uh, I think the second one is natural gas, which is essentially what we're using here. And then there's uh, a few other technologies. But you can see they're looking at Burlington and in New York City. Uh, and at Portland, one of the reasons Portland's little black bar is so small is because they have A, a lot of hydro, and B, a lot of um, uh, wind at this point. So their emissions on their electricity are down quite a bit. So I didn't get one thing. Um, yes. You said that geothermal still has carbon emissions, and you said because it uses electricity, or? It yes. Um, yeah. I don't follow. Okay. Well, you, you'll see it as we go through, and, and it was interesting because when you introduced it, you were talking about using geothermal to generate electricity. Yeah. And that's not the kind of geothermal that we're talking about here. Okay. There is, you know, in widespread use, particularly in the West, um, going down to the, the magma layer or, or close to it of the Earth and using that heat differential to generate electricity. Right. It's possible to do that here. Dave Bradley, who's one of our kind of engineering friends, you know, has a whole scheme for doing it with Lake Erie, but what we're talking about is using the, the earth um, that is warmed by the sun. So it's really a form of solar energy. It's called geothermal because you're using the thermal properties of the geo, the earth. But it's, it's not really that kind of, um, and it's not electrical generation. It, it generates heating and cooling. Um, yes? How bad natural gas well, that's a good question. You know, they say that natural gas, I think, is about half as bad as coal. That's in the burning. But there's been real interesting studies done lately because of the whole fracking thing of what happens when you do hydrofrack. And there is a lot of methane that's released into the air when you do that. There are leaks in the process. And what these scientists at Cornell, and I'd be happy to, you know, if you give me a, your email or something, send you the study have found that, especially over the next 20 years, because methane is a much worse um, carbon or, or greenhouse gas, but it only lasts in the atmosphere like 20 years. It lasts less than carbon dioxide. Over the next 20 years, um, carbon, uh, the, the carbon emissions are worse with hydrofract natural gas than they are with coal. Okay. George? You maybe just covered the one question I had. If you didn't already cover how long the carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases stay in the air once they're there, in yeah. other words, even if we just stop the day. Right. Um, did you cover flip over effect at all, or will you? I'm not familiar with that term. I mean, at the end, if you want, I'll go over it, because it's pretty okay. serious and considered a real threat. Why don't you do a minute on it? Huh? Why don't you do a minute on it now, because we're going to kind of move from climate change. Um, I mean, if people don't know, look, there, there's only one ocean current. We name them. One what? There's only one ocean current. One. Okay. We, we name it based on when it's near the surface. It goes down and up. I mean, so if it comes from the Gulf, we name it that. But it's just one driven ocean current. There's a lot of like a conveyor belt. Continuous conveyor belt. Exactly. One conveyor belt. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a, a lot of concern. Um, going back to you know, our old friend Lester and what David Suzuki knows, right? 
The pump over effect is if enough ice per fresh water gets into the salt water, it'll reverse what's going on with that current. Right. And then they're talking about ice age. I mean, right now, as you know, London and Scotland, I mean, there are palm trees in Inverness, Scotland, because that Gulf Stream goes up there. And uh, if you look at the globe, you'll, you'll know that London is as far north as the middle of Hudson Bay. But London doesn't get snow. And that's all because of the Gulf Stream. And if that reverses or flips over because of a lot of fresh water from melting, yes. they're going to go cold. Yeah, I have to say that I hadn't heard that term, but yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's considered, you know, a possibility. And right. again, everything is chaos theory, we don't know. Yeah. It's all chaos theory. I mean, that's a lot of what you're looking at when you're looking at climate change. I mean, there's tipping points, you know, after which you, you start doing things and they, they accelerate and they kind of add to each other. Well, um, and then while I'm asking, and this really is a question that I, I definitely don't know. Um, way back again when, when we were working with Lester and, and with that whole group and we go to Ottawa to work with the Canadian government, in the uh, early 90s they had already published their How to Deal with the Eco Refugees report. The Canadian government was dealing with it. But I'm, I'm wondering now, I'm asking, the assumption is that because we call it global warming, that everybody don't want to go north. And even, even they were assuming it. But I'm wondering now, as, as a bit of an ecologist, if I'm on it in that group, be, because closer to the equator, they're already handling species, flora and fauna with very warm temperatures, might they actually not suffer less even than, than up in the middle of Canada? I don't know. Yeah, Are they going to adapt better since the, the trees in the middle of Canada and the animals aren't going to be able to migrate? Well, to my mind, it's, you know, it's, Every, every area is going to have, uh, and it'll, it'll be different, right. I'm sure, but, you know, we're at least um, theoretically all facing a similar, you know, kind of 10 degree Fahrenheit change. And, it, you know, the tropics, if that gets 10 degrees warmer, you're going to deal with, you know, the whole impact of a lot more um, uh, evaporation. You know, so the, the ecology is going to change quite a bit and it's going to dry out. You know, it's, I, don't, I don't think you can really say that because they've dealt with warmth that they're going to be able to deal with 10 more degrees of warmth. I don't disagree. I'm just saying that yeah. it, it gives me pause to think about it, though. But yep. If it really is safe to assume that we all can invest right now in property up around what's in the We probably should. You know, I have a question about the graph up there. Um, is that graph dealing just with the emissions generated by the electricity needed to run each of those? No, no. It's the emissions of using those. The emissions of so using natural those gas. Are, it would be okay. the emissions from burning the gas. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And and is it just from using them, or does it also take into account the emissions needed to construct them? For example, uh, the emissions that it were, would be involved in the mining of right. natural gas or the emissions involved in constructing metal piping for geothermal. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Sorry. Okay, so in terms of giving us hope, this is my friend Susan Shea's house on Woodbridge Avenue in Buffalo. This house is a net zero house. She has geothermal heating and cooling. She has solar generation of electricity. She generated more electricity last year than she used. Um, so she's all in the good at this point, at least in terms of her house. I mean, there's still automobiles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is a, kind of a carport that was built in front of her garage. It's got solar panels on top of it. That's the side of her garage. There's solar panels there. This is her bill that she got. And you can see the, the top arrow points to zero in terms of current charges. The, uh, other two arrows, essentially the one that points left, shows that um, she, her reading this month is less than her reading last month. And then over uh, the arrow on the far left kind of shows her usage over several months, um, most of those being zeros on the left. And then there was some usage of uh, electricity during, during the winter months when she was, I, I think those are winter months, 
Um, but overall, she netted um, electricity. She generated more than she used, and she didn't use any, you know, gas for her heating. Chris, you were going to say something. How many people live there? I I don't know. Her and her husband do. I don't know if their kids are home at this point or not. I, I asked. It's like the question is always economies of scale. Yeah. Like to to mass produce efficient. Energy, and then you have to get into political willpower yep. and changing. And, uh, and that final point is like the northern and southern, like people in the south, the global south, uh, may be poor in our economic terms, but are very rich in terms of communal, uh, philosophical, spiritual advancements. So the, the northern countries also need to incorporate some of that too. We, the northern countries may have the technological solutions that cause the problems, but we also have to acknowledge that great contribution from the global south. Sure, sure. And, and you know, say, say, saying what you're saying makes me think of something, which is, I'm talking about one technology and about um, using this renewable technology. I mean, there's a whole other, you know, body of knowledge and stuff that we need to talk about in terms of energy efficiency and in terms of not wasting energy. Um, and I want to acknowledge that. I mean, I, I gave a talk at one point, and somebody came up and, and started talking to me about, oh, you didn't mention sprawl, and they were really angry at me for that. <laughs> you know, and sprawl is important, and it, it's all part of the system. But I'm just giving it one part of the Okay, so that's Susan's house. This is the corner of Jefferson and Glenwood. And you can see a wind turbine there, which blew my mind. I've been biking down Jefferson for the last several months to work. And there's a functioning wind turbine there that's, that's generating electricity. So, you know, Buffalo is a good place for renewable energy. It's possible to do it. People are doing it, and it is possible to get to net zero in this area. There's no special um, hurdles one has to jump through to to be able to put up a wind turbine like that. There is, um, you know, and I don't know if the, if if they got permitting for it or what. And and when I go by on windy days, you know, the the the, the um, Guy wires are, are pretty loose, um, 